Elon Musk reveals a really interesting wrinkle on version 11 software, assuming it ever comes out. Plus, price cuts are in Europe as well as China and the United States. And what does a 20% drop in Tesla's EV prices mean? Do they lose 20% or is there a nuance to this as well? Let's take a look. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. So I'm going to start with an update to my US price cuts video, which is right here, that I found out just after filming that video. And that is that not only in China and the United States did Tesla do these massive price cuts, they also did it in Europe as well. And they did slightly different price cuts because obviously there's different nuances to the way that they're doing productions and potential EV rebates and things like that. So anyway, it's obvious that Tesla has made a play to go into all the major markets and essentially just eviscerate the competition. <laughs> They've pretty much decided that they're just going to lower prices across the board and they're going to take as much market share as possible and profits be damned for a little while and then we'll figure it out later. And on that note, one thing there have been rumors about, and this is wildly just rumors, which is why I've got my It's Speculation Time shirt on today, which you can get at the merch store if you want. But anyway, there are rumors that these price drops, these super aggressive price drops might only last for a short period of time on the order of weeks or months. Now, again, don't take what I'm saying with anything like some sort of confidence. I do not know the answer to this question. Only Tesla knows that, but that has been in the rumor mill. So there are people suggesting that if you want to purchase a Tesla Model Y or Model 3 in particular, now would be the time to do it. But again, don't take my word for that. I would wait until you get a little bit more news. Although obviously Tesla is not in the habit of releasing this information before they actually do these moves. So what they might do is not do something like raise it right back to the original amount. What they might do is they might increase it by 500 or a thousand dollars or something along those lines. Anyway, if you don't need a car, then you don't have to worry about it. If you do need a car, then maybe earlier is better. Plus the fact you'll get earlier in the queue. So you'll be able to get your vehicle sooner. So now let's talk about these price cuts. If we can sort of generalize this to approximately 15 to 18% price cuts, you know, it's <laughs> they're all over the place from just a couple of percentage points all the way up to nearly 25%. So they're all over the place. But if we just kind of like, let's just say 18% for just kind of a round number to be able to apply to this, people are saying, oh no, their profit margins are going to go from like 25% gross margins or 28% gross margins down to only like 10% gross margins or 8% gross margins, which puts them much more in the realm of you know standard automakers legacy automakers but there are a couple of things working against this the number one thing is that tesla is also going to be eligible probably we don't know yet it's very confusing at least in the united states for the 30 dollars per kilowatt hour battery credit as well on their end and so if they do that just as again round numbers if you have a 100 kilowatt hour battery you're looking at a three thousand dollar reduction in the price of the vehicle because of those rebates so obviously most of their cars have less than 100 kilowatt hours, but basically that just gives you an idea that that effectively reduces the price of the vehicle for them to produce so they can pass that savings on to the consumer if they want to, and I guess they are at this point. But of course, that's not the really, really big lever that Tesla particularly, I really, nobody else, no other auto manufacturer has this, but Tesla can sell very expensive software to the consumer after the fact or at the point of sale. And by the way, these rebates, right, If they, remember that the cap in the United States, and I'm not going to say this for every other country because I don't know this in detail, but I think this is true. But basically, you know, you've got a $55,000 cap for the Model Y. And so at $52,990, you can add a tow hitch and an optional paint color, and it still comes in at under $55,000. So it's eligible for that cap. But adding full self-driving, adding the software package, which is $15,000, so it's a lot of money, that does not affect the eligibility of the vehicle for the tax rebate in the United States. Again, I don't know about the EU and China. China. But anyway, at least in the United States, which is the place where full self-driving is the most advanced and where most people would want to use it, you can still be eligible for the $7,500 off even if you choose to purchase the full self-driving package and pay the $15,000. And remember that the marginal cost of shipping out that software is basically zero. The, the software already exists on your car as far as I understand it. It's just them flipping a switch. So <laughs> you've already got the software on your vehicle. There's not really anything, maybe a couple of dollars or something like that for them 
to flip the switch and turn full self-driving on. So basically, this is you know 90 plus percent pure profit that they're getting. And yeah, they have to do development costs and all that stuff gets rolled in. I'm just talking about the marginal cost of another license for full self-driving. That's basically zero. So I mean, we may be talking 99% profit margins in that. And if you want to roll in the cost of development and all that, maybe it's closer to 80%. But still, these are massive, massive margins. So for comparison, if you buy a Ford F-150 Lightning, they're not selling you anything very expensive on the back end of this. So they can't afford to cut prices and have even less. I mean, they're barely making any money right now on these vehicles. So they would actually lose money if they cut prices. But then they don't have this subsequent ability to sell very expensive software to the consumer. And so, you know, they're not going to get, obviously Tesla is not going to get 100% take rate. But even if they're only getting like 20% take rate on this $15,000 software, that starts to mitigate their profit losses. So instead of dropping to single digit profit margins, they're probably going to still be up in the team maybe even 20%. I've seen people with a lot more knowledge about this kind of stuff say they're still going to be at 20% or above profit margins. So, you know, nobody needs to feel sorry for Tesla. Elon Musk said that they were more interested in taking market share than they were in making profits for the time being. But we don't have to worry about Tesla going into the red, as in losing money per car, because all of these mitigating factors, plus the fact that they are getting more and more and more efficient at building these vehicles, and they've got Berlin and Austin ramping up, which means that, again, you know, the, the marginal cost of producing one more vehicle keeps going down. So they're going to be fine, right? They're not going to make as much profit as they were in the past. But Elon Musk said that those elevated prices that happened during the pandemic and then the chip shortage were frankly embarrassing. That's what he said. So it was obvious they were going to reduce the prices at some point. And they started doing it in China and the US at least at the end of 2022 because they already had a lot of price reductions in place. Those were temporary, but now these ones are here. They may be temporary. Anyway, you know, <laughs> buyer beware. What is it? Caveat emptor. You just need to be okay with whatever the price is today that you purchase something for. And if it goes up or down after that, then, you know, that's what it does. But I was saying there were people in China who are protesting the fact that they paid too much money for a Tesla at the end of 2022. And now they want, you know, money back or a rebate or something. And, you know, I do understand their pain because that is it was a major price drop. But at the same time, you know, when I purchased a 48 inch television set for two thousand dollars 10 years ago, and I know that's 10 years ago, not last month. But anyway, now I, I don't complain when I go out and purchase a 65 inch TV for like four hundred dollars. Right. That, that's just expected that electronics, this kind of thing goes down in price. Which leads to an interesting question, which is the commoditization of EVs. So automobiles became commoditized to some extent, but they're never able to be built really cheaply, right? So, so things that become commoditized, things like cameras, cell phones, computers, lots of electronic devices, things like that. These things that, you know, at the beginning, they're very expensive because they're made by a few companies. They cost a lot of money to do the research, all of that. And then over time, the prices come down because more and more companies make it. The technology gets better. You have rights law coming into play where you have this reduction in price per doubling of volume. So eventually you get a commoditization of whatever it is. And EVs as opposed to ICE cars could become pretty much fully commoditized commoditized because they don't cost, they won't cost, they still do, but eventually they won't cost nearly as much as an ICE car to manufacture. So the prices can come down pretty drastically. Eventually we could get something of the quality of a Model Y for, you know, the equivalent of maybe fifteen to $20,000 right now. Obviously, inflation is going to change all of that equation. But anyway, you know what I'm saying, right? So we're going to we're going to have the price or less. It'll be less than half the price, substantially less than half the price, maybe 35 or 40 percent of that in a decade. So you're going to see the prices of these things drop because manufacture of them. There's kind of like a baseline manufacturing difficulty with making an internal combustion engine. They're very complicated. They're very heavy. They have a ton of moving parts. So that's that's kind of a limiting factor for how low the price of an ICE car can go. You don't really have that with an EV vehicle, right? You've already got that Wuling Mini in China for five grand. Now, it's not much of a car, but it is a car. <laughs> It'll get you around. It's got an electric motor and some batteries and a tiny little space for you to sit in. So you can already see how this can become very, very commoditized. And people are saying this is bad news for Tesla, but actually Tesla wants this to happen. That was their whole point. The whole point was to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. 
And of course, none of this takes into account the full self-driving wrinkle of all of this, and that is if and when Tesla solves full self-driving and gets regulatory approval to roll it out, that means that you know it, the car becomes unimportant at that point because more and more people will choose to just have robo-taxi transportation for at least one of their vehicles, if not all of their vehicles. So over time, we'll look at vehicle costs being kind of almost inconsequential, but it will still matter to Tesla because again, if it costs them $40,000 to build a vehicle, just say that's what it is, right? So if it costs them that much and they're rolling out a robo taxi, it's going to cost them a certain amount per mile to make that money back on manufacturing costs. Whereas if they can eventually build a vehicle for $15,000, which could be possible, a reasonable vehicle for 15 grand, and that's their manufacturer costs, again, probably not the retail cost, but that doesn't matter, right? So they're able to make this for less than half the cost that they're making it now, and therefore they can charge less per mile to make up for the cost of manufacturing of the vehicle and still make massive profits. So while it seems like a lot of people are really worried about EVs becoming commoditized and what that's going to do to Tesla, I think it's actually going to be all to the good for Tesla. Now, at the same time, as far as competition is concerned, they're going to all disappear. <laughs> if they can't follow Tesla down this rabbit hole really, really quickly, nobody's going to want to buy them. Again, why would you buy? I think a Chevy Bolt is now substantially more expensive than a Model 3 is to purchase. So why would you want to purchase a Chevy Bolt, which is not as good a vehicle, has had major problems and you can't even really get one because GM doesn't manufacture them very much or alternatively the Ford F-150 Lightning when the Cybertruck comes out etc cetera, etc cetera, right if Tesla can massively undercut the competition people are just going to go ahead and buy Teslas and we could see like most cars on the road in 10 years being Teslas so anyway, price cuts all over the globe from Tesla. They're going to reduce their profit margins, but not as much as you think they are going to. So don't worry about Tesla and watch out everybody else because the commoditization of EVs is actually really, really bad news for everybody but Tesla and maybe companies like BYD in China. And speaking of robo taxis and full self-driving, let's turn to version 11 of Tesla's software. I've been considering titling this vehicle Star Wars V11, the Phantom release. I went back and looked and my initial Tesla full self-driving version 11 release notes were on November 11th, so two months ago, and we still don't have official official release notes. We still don't have it released into the wild, so it is definitely taking its time. Anyway, that leads to Tesla owners of Silicon Valley yesterday saying when full self-driving beta version 11.3, which I guess is the current version of it. Who knows what happened to 11.1 and 11.2. Anyway, Elon Musk said should start rolling out later this week, next week at the latest. So currently it's the 15th of January, so hopefully that means like before the 25th of January or so. <laughs> we, can, we can at least hope. There's been a lot of hope in the past about version 11 coming out. But here comes the interesting wrinkle. Tesla owners of Silicon Valley said, cool, anything you are personally excited about about this build? And Elon responded, many small things. We're starting to make use of neural nets for vehicle navigation and control, not just vision. And that, my friends, is really exciting news. So really, really broadly, you can watch my videos about how Tesla does all of this stuff and what neural networks are and all of that kind of stuff. Just check out, you know, search around in my videos. You'll find all of that stuff. There's a bunch of them. But anyway, if we kind of want to broadly separate things out, there's a vision component, which is understanding the world, right? That's making sense. It's looking at these video images and possibly radar eventually, I don't know, and ultrasonics and things like that. If the car has that, a lot of them don't anymore. But anyway, it's taking all of that and integrating it together into kind of a video game sense of what the world around it looks like, right? So it's turning these pixels into 3D objects, vector objects of cars and all of this stuff and saying, where am I in space and what is around me? And then after that, there's a whole other bucket, which is called the policy network, which is the thing that actually makes the decisions. So what's happened over time, Andre Carpathy talked about this a long time ago, and it's you know taken place more and more over time, is that the vision part of it, the understanding the world part has gone to software version 2.0, which is pretty much all neural networks. So so more and more and more, this is becoming just about entirely neural network based. And a big deal with version 11 of the software is that the highway stack is going from the old, like, five-year-old version of software at this point that was not so much neural network based. It was a lot of hard-coded C code and things like that. It's going to pretty much all neural network based. But up until this point, at least as far as I know, the policy network has been hard-coded, which means, you know, kind of if you've done any programming, it's like if-then statements, things like that, right? So like if going 65 miles an hour and car in front of me is going 45 miles an hour and we're less than 500 meters away from that car or something, then 
then begin to slow down. So you've got a whole bunch of like just, you know, cascading if then statements. And the policy network is basically just looking through a branching network of possible things to do and making a decision from that. And that's cool and you can really analyze it and you can pretty well figure out exactly what the car is going to do. But it also means that the car is not very flexible. It's pretty brittle. It has to have a bucket to put the decision into. And that bucket has to be a clear bucket. So that means the thing that's actually driving your car can be rather brittle. It can make decisions that are, you know, feel robotic or jerky or things like that, or even potentially kind of dumb decisions in really edge case scenarios. So the making use of neural networks for vehicle navigation and control means that what they're doing is they're beginning to roll software version 2.0 or, you know, machine learning neural networks into this part, into this bucket, into the policy bucket about how the vehicle actually performs. And the thing about neural networks is they're really good with fuzzy data. They deal with probabilities. They deal with uncertainties really, really well, as opposed to traditional code, which really doesn't do that. So what we should get out of these neural networks for policy and control of the vehicle is smoother, more probabilistic decision making, which means it can make kind of half and half decisions, things like that, right? If it needs to sort of sneak over in a lane to get around a car that's slowing down but is out of your way but not quite out of your way, it won't have to make that like er, kind of jerky stop thing, wait for the car to get out and then go around. It can do more like a human where it can actually kind of slide around that car. Or I hope like even in my neighborhood, like my left hand turn onto my road, onto my street is always kind of like e -e -e -e, like a little bit jerky as it does that. So hopefully the, the neural network for this navigation and control will allow it to turn more smoothly because it will be able to deal with something that's not 100% like yes or no. So in other words, with version 11 of this full self-driving software, not only should the highway stack be much more human-like, it shouldn't have that robotic thing where it sits there and turns its blinker six times before it goes across. It doesn't get out of the way of traffic very efficiently. You know, it, it feels like a robot driving, but overall, we should also get the actual turning and braking and maneuvering around traffic and stuff like that should begin to feel more human-like. It should feel a little less robotic, a little less like it's making these kind of all or nothing decisions at every second. And if it does that, that's going to be a really major upgrade. It's not like it drives badly right now, but there are definitely moments where you're like, that's not a human being driving. That's a robot driving the car. And if it starts to roll this 2.0 software into the policy network, that means that the car should drive even more human-like, which is something to really look forward to. All right. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it fun and interesting and thought provoking. If you did, please do like it so other people can find it. And also, of course, consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. And of course, let me know in the comments what you think about all of this. There's a lot of stuff going on right now with Tesla. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon. Thank you all so much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. Happy 2023 to everybody. And of course, if you want to join the team, just check out the link in the description. And if you're interested in a whole bunch of really cool merch, check out our merch store. Link is in the description. We have Tesla bot t-shirts, the Tesla meme t-shirt, success is a possible outcome, 4680 battery cells. All of that stuff is on t-shirts, mugs, tumblers, and on and on. So check it out. And for those of you interested in investing, check out Webull, an amazing platform for buying and selling stocks, and now cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and others. Open an account and get a free stock valued at up to $200, and fund your account and get another free stock valued at up to $1,600. Check out the link in the description and help the channel at the same time. Thank you. And finally, don't forget we are both Tesla and Amazon affiliates. If you look in the description, you can see how going shopping for a solar roof, a power wall, or anything on Amazon helps out the channel. In the meantime, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.